Well, January is tough, isn't it? Right? Um, I, I'm Lori. Welcome to Church One. If you've never been here before, we're so glad you're here. And even if you've been here a million times, we're glad you're here. Um, but I, I know January is a hard month for a lot of people. Uh, so I have this radio show, and I'm always looking for ways to be redemptive. So I was asking people, what's to love about January? <laughs> it's a short list, people. Uh, let's see, people said things like it's the chance to start over a new year. Um, some people said we're glad the holidays are behind us, because there's a lot of pressure, I think, of the holidays. You know, some people said simple things like um, having a fire in the fireplace. I thought crock pot right away. January, just, you know, hibernate, go in. Uh, but I know January's a tough month, and I just wanted to say it uh, for a lot of people who struggle with, just can get down sometimes. January really can be, can be hard, and as I think about what we're talking about today, I just wanted to say that we're there with you. We, we know. We know it's not always an easy month. I can't remember the last time I felt truly calm. I've started wondering if maybe it just doesn't happen here. I'm not talking about the way a person feels after they've had a drink or two, or even the way you feel when you're floating in water on a still August day, or just staring at the moon and feeling like there really are no words to describe the majesty of God. I'm talking about inside, feeling calm inside. I had a physical a few months ago, and my doctor uh, was talking about the stress that she was experiencing. Now. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, she's probably not that far from retiring. You know, by now in her career, she must be getting things pretty much the way she wants them. Even though I know that's not true as someone who's been in a career a really long time. But I probed, and I wanted to know what's so stressful, you know. And, you know, I'm thinking it's medical malpractice lawsuits or something. She said she takes paperwork home most every night, so she feels like her job is never over in the day. Uh, she went on to say that the biggest stress she has is not from the threat of medical malpractice. It's relational. She said, it's just getting along with the people in my office. So then I asked about her patients and if she was seeing an increase in their overall anxiety. And she said, without missing a beat, yes, especially since the election. She went on to say that young people, millennials, were more anxious and depressed than any other age group. Now, I've got my theories about that. One being, I think they're possibly the first generation that expects life to be perfect. And I blame it all on those DYI or whatever shows where you can get everything perfect, you know? Perfect house, perfect face, perfect. And I think once the reality of life hits and they realize it's not all perfect, that's stressful. And they also don't generally get paid enough to make things as perfect as they need them to be, right? But anxiety is real. <laughs> what we're feeling on the inside, the stuff that, that ties us up in knots and keeps us so on edge that when the real hard parts of life happen, even the not so hard parts of life, we get shaken, we're destabilized. There's an in-depth article in Baltimore Magazine this month about eating disorders. National surveys estimate that 20 million women and 10 million men will have had an eating disorder at some point in their lives. There was a 400% increase in males being hospitalized for anorexia from 1996 to 2011. While teenage girls are particularly vulnerable, anorexia is on the rise across most populations. Children as young as eight and as the baby boomer generation tries to deal with the aging process, they too are turning toward eating disorders as a way to recapture their youth. Stephen Crawford at Shepherd Pratt says for people who are working toward the ideal body, the perfectionistic personality, it only heightens body dissatisfaction and the finish line keeps moving. For our kids, the drive for popularity likes followers, combined with anonymous bullying, can really exacerbate comparison thinking. 
anxiety, negative thoughts about themselves and their body. They have the capacity now to take hundreds of selfies and then apply the filter. I just found out about the filter recently. Had no idea. I don't like selfies. That's another story. There are even apps where you can change your weight in the image that you just took a picture of to portray what is ideal. And social media has definitely made things worse, not that they're big bad everything, but Crawford says genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. The finish line keeps moving. Can't life feel a lot like that? You watch the news, you come away thinking things are pretty shaky. Government shutdown, mudslides, missile launches, sexual abuse in the workplace while training for the Olympics, child abuse at home. Ice storms, new environmental norms. So how do we remain unshaken? Maybe there are some clues in the words David speaks to us in today's psalm, Psalm 62. Starting in verse 6, this psalm was written, I was just thinking about this last night, I wonder if he was up during the night writing this, because he's in a cave, he's hiding, he's running for his life, he's the king, and they're trying to kill him. So David starts this chapter by saying, when we start in the very beginning of the book, uh, this chapter, he, he starts by saying, truly my soul finds rest in God, my salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation, he's my fortress, and I will never be shaken. He's obviously in a very shaky situation, but he still says those words, I will not be shaken. So how can he say it? How can he say that? He repeats the same words farther down in the psalm. That's where we're going to stay this morning. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He's my mighty rock and my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath. The highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I've heard. Power belongs to you, God. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward everyone according to what they've done. I don't like that verse makes you feel. If you've been away the past couple of weeks, you might not know that Mike Donahue has been teaching on the Psalms. So last week it was Psalm 139, and Mike talked about um, beauty. He uh, talked about how God made us and knows us, and that we should try and find the beauty in that. I even heard he had a dog story, and I can't believe I missed that, because I love dogs. But I love the whole concept. I actually wrote a piece one time about just the need for beauty in your life and finding beauty. When our kids were little, we used to always ask at the dinner table, all right, let's everybody name a highlight. <laughs> and they all go, oh. But I think it'd be a cool thing to ask your kids around the dinner table, what's, just give me a beauty. Give me a beauty moment from today. A moment where you felt the beauty of God. Where, where did it happen today? So it was beauty last week, the week before from Psalm 29. It was the idea of you know, being spiritually aware, looking for God. In fact, Mike said that this time we're in right now, called Epiphany, basically means now that Jesus has come, we actually need to start looking for him. There's an idea. So this week it's stability. What keeps us from feeling jarred, agitated, upset, disquieted, troubled, uneasy, anxious, and distraught? What calms us when all others around are losing their way? What's the saying? The Rudyard Kipling, it's too long to read all of it, but if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good or talk too wise. See, but that's part of it. Just part of it. You can go online and read the rest. But he asked the question, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs. 
And I read that and I wonder if it should say, if you can keep your heart, not losing heart, because I think when we get shaken, that's what happens. We lose heart. There's actually a medical condition now. It's called, and I'm sure I'm going to murder this, tachosubo cardiomyopathy. It's broken heart syndrome. They say it happens when someone undergoes serious emotional or physical stress, like the death of a loved one, being involved in a natural disaster, just missed opportunities in life that they never got over. More than 90% of reported cases are women between the ages of 58 and 75. And the effect on the heart, doctors say, is similar to have had, having had an actual heart attack. So they're studying a lot about it. So I was listening to a teacher a few weeks ago. And he was revisiting the well-known verse in Proverbs about vision, where there's no vision, the people perish. You've heard it before, right? So Daryl, this teacher, said that it's really a misunderstood verse. That if you break it down in the original language, it actually means where there's no prophetic vision, people are out of control. Where there's no divine vision, people are out of control. As my mom liked to say, like chickens with their heads cut off. It isn't about us getting a vision for ourselves. It's about God giving us a vision for ourselves. Having a divine vision for your life helps you to look for God more often, for direction, for deliverance, for life, for hope. So this year, it's my, my prayer that God will give me his vision for my life, and it will not feel as out of control as it has. Because instead of trying to take refuge in work or home or finances or friends or my own understanding, I want to look for him first for answers and direction. And I don't want you to misunderstand here. I've for many, many years put my hope in Christ. But I'm not sure that's what I always put my faith in. I think I've let a lot of other people pull my strings. And that's basically putting faith in places that will keep me on shaky ground. It isn't enough to just hope in Christ. I have to start believing what is true, that he is the only one who knows where I should go. And if someone is going to be pulling the strings of my life, I want it to be Jesus. I was just picturing a puppet with strings. Now, is that a marionette? A marionette has the strings. Somebody's pulling on those strings to make you move, to make you respond, to make you walk through life. There are good things that pull on our strings, our families, serving people, things that get our attention. But even those can get in the way of what God has for us. I really do think it's a fight for our lives. I really do. Where there's no divine vision, the people perish, things are out of control. I think when we put our faith in anything other than God, it costs us something. It takes a part of us. We're all dying. But have you ever felt it? You ever really felt it? Have you ever come to one of those places in life that just places in life where you, you kind of feel shaken so hard you feel like you've got a glimpse of that? What it feels like to be dying. I've heard people describe divorce that way. It felt like kind of a death. Serious health issues, job loss, a sudden major life change, losing a child or a parent, the stuff that breaks your heart. Breaks your heart. If you're putting your faith in God, the only true deliverer and protector, it doesn't make the pain go away. This isn't like, here's all you need to do. It makes you know that at the core of your being, it's going to be okay. Sometimes Ed will say that to me yesterday. In fact, after I had a really difficult day on Friday, he said everything was going to be okay. And don't you hate it when somebody says that? You're in the middle of a crisis. You're trying to complain. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I remember once when Ed and I were first married, my car was parked on the street in front of our house. Somebody coming home late at night from work fell asleep, and they hit my car, and they totaled it. Now, that story would be sad in itself, but I had just gotten the car out of storage. The insurance hadn't kicked in yet, and a friend at work told me it was going to be okay because that's what people say. <laughs> That's what they think you want to hear. 
Well, the car situation wasn't okay. There was no insurance. I had a loan out on it. No money at the time to pay that loan off. I was okay. And when Ed said it yesterday that it's going to be okay, when Ed said that, as someone else in my life who's trying to put their faith in God, I knew it was really true. I am going to be okay. Because you know what? God is my refuge and my deliverer, and God will be satisfied. The victory is his. Isaiah 53. Isaiah talks about Jesus so beautifully in that chapter. You know how he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. In verse 8 he says about Jesus, For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. He will be satisfied. God is pulling all of the strings on your little marionette, on this world. I think we could say those words of ourselves that after we have suffered here in the earthly realm, we will see the light of life. Right? The coming of his kingdom. In Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Why is that so hard to believe? That he's for us. That he's real. That he's faithful. God's our shield. He's our protector. We really can't live without him. We can't really live. We can, we can walk through life. We can have somebody pulling our string. But we can't really feel alive. Picture life as a video game, if you like. Some of you will like that. God is the only one who can beat everything that rocks your world as you're walking through it. Psalm 62 says, He's our rock and our salvation, our fortress and refuge. One translation says, instead of salvation, our deliverance. And we will not be shaken. One of my favorite verses in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. He'll fight for you. I pray it every time I go into a meeting at work, before I go in, Father, fight for me. Help me to be still where I should be still. And that's really hard. That is really hard when you're in a battle with someone. I've said this before. I think I get the most weary at the end of the day from holding inside all the things I could have said. It's that mental editing that fatigues you. Calvin said this, we're prone to keeping our troubles pent up in our hearts until we're driven to despair. Right? That's why we need to pray. We need to cry out. Maybe scream out loud sometimes to God. I prayed this morning. I, I was talking in the car on the way here. Things I needed God to deliver me from. Confessing things that I had done wrong. Talking about my hopes and dreams. We do need protection from ourselves. You know that, right? I thought maybe we could take a minute. Now, this could be a little freaky or scary for some people and don't feel you have to participate. But just say out loud what we need God's help for today. Just what do we need God's help for today? So you came thinking that you were just going to sit here and drink your coffee. What do you need God's help for today? Can you say the words? Can you say it out loud? I heard that. Everything. Yeah. Perseverance. In life, in something particular, or just in life? Just in life, yeah. Perseverance. Finish well. Yeah. I love the words of Agar in, in Proverbs 30. He says, I am weary, God, but I can prevail. I love that. Sometimes I'll just say that. I'm really weary, God, but I can prevail. I can. He says that because he knows that God will prevail. It's going to be okay. He goes on to say that God is his shield. Okay, we're back in the video game. Everything ultimately bouncing off you because the everlasting God is your shield. Then he, Agar, does something really important. He reminds himself of who God is. 
He says, who else has gone up to heaven and come down? Whose hands have gathered up the wind? Who has wrapped the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Okay, there it is. There it is. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. What do you take refuge in? What or who makes you feel secure? Sometimes it's really lightweight stuff, getting a compliment, getting affirmed for a job well done. How many likes you got on your last post on social media? How many people have friended you? If the weather's nice. Hmm? Or it could be bigger stuff, like the love of your family or getting a good medical report. But it isn't enough. It isn't enough. None of those things, none of those people can hold all the despair that can fill up your heart in January or in February or in March or April or May. Tim Keller says, the battle to shape our hearts with the truth that our minds know is never over. So he's talking about all the stuff we read in the Bible. Are we letting it actually speak to our hearts and sink in. The things we know but we don't do. We know we can take refuge in, in him, but instead we, we run to other places, right? So after reflecting on the psalm today, Psalm 62, Tim wrote out this prayer. Lord, the deepest impulse of my heart is to do things to secure your blessing rather than to rest in what Christ has done for me. This only makes me anxious and in turn, insecure and self-righteous. Lord, help me to prosper in my work, but don't let career ups and downs have power over me. Provide for my family's financial needs, but don't let wealth have dominion over me. I need not love the good things less, but to love you far more than them. Give me the freedom that comes only through loving you intensely. Tim says, if we trust God alone, we no longer fully trust in anything else. But it's a reset every day. Every day you get up. Every day. I think we automatically look to what's in front of us, right? Who's right here? What just happened? Who just said that to me? Why didn't my kids call me last night? <laughs> Ed's laying in bed last night. Our kids don't care about it. <laughs> Why? He goes, they never call. Like, You're the parent. You call them. <laughs> it's just funny. I love what Joseph says in Genesis to his brothers who've betrayed him. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Okay. How could he say that? His brothers threw him in a hole. He could have died down there. They come back before him, and he forgives them because it was God's plan is what he's telling them. And the reason he could do that was because God was Joseph's refuge. He wasn't trusting anything or anyone else to hold him up and shield him from life's injustices. Don't you ever go through something you're like, that's not fair. That's an unjust. Mm. Yeah. I want to mention, too, that some of us are more prone to being anxious or being shaken. Martin Lloyd-Jones says in his book, Spiritual Depression, its causes and cure, and this is interesting, that most of our unhappiness in life is due to the fact that we're listening to ourselves instead of talking to ourselves. He says, rather than just going along with the thoughts that come into your head, those thoughts that roll over and over, those thoughts that bring back all the problems of yesterday, you've got to take yourself in hand, preach to yourself, and question yourself. What are you worried about? Name it. Speak it. And then encourage yourself to put your trust in God, to hope in him, to take refuge in him. Remind yourself of who he is. If that means pulling out scripture and reading some of those words I read a minute ago. Right? Remind yourself who he is, what he's done, and what he will do on earth and in you. David does it in Psalm 62 when he says, Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. What's he doing? He's in a cave. He's scared, and he's reminding himself that his God's love never fails him, that God alone is powerful. He's a king, but God, the ultimate king. 
David tells us in verse 8 to pour our hearts out to him. Pastor Stephen Cole says, We must fight for our stability in God, fight for our peace so that God will be glorified and others will be drawn to that peace that he offers. Think about that. I think that's really hard, right? Do you ever walk out of a place where you know maybe you didn't do as well as you could have to represent God? Maybe in that argument, maybe in that meeting you were in, maybe in that conversation you had with a friend or one of your kids. It wasn't really. So I read this story of this guy. His wife was having their third child. There were complications. They had to take the baby early. They didn't know if one of them was going to die. And his mother-in-law, he was a believer, actually got mad at him because he didn't seem that upset. She's like, what's the matter with you? Don't you care about my daughter? Don't you care? I don't see anything. I don't see you worrying. Because <laughs> God was his refuge. He was worried. I'm sure he was concerned. But there was a peace that passed her understanding. I know when I've been in a situation where I feel shaken or threatened, my whole countenance can change. I get agitated. I can start making poor choices about what I'm saying, how I treat people. The Lord will fight for you. All you need to do is be still. That is a good lesson to learn. Sometimes I'll ask him, so God, how are you fighting for me? Because <laughs> like that last thing I was just a part of, I wasn't feeling it. How exactly is that fight going? You know, you want to question him. I hope my words today have encouraged you to pray, to speak what's on your heart to God, and to exalt him. Those are the only two things we did in life, pray and exalt him. Say to yourself as much as you can who he is, what he's done, and what he will do. He really is, truly, our only refuge. He alone is worthy of it, of protecting your life, of keeping you of keeping you. David said, my salvation, my deliverance, and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times. Pour your hearts out to him. And remember, you may be weary, but you will prevail. Because he'll prevail, and it's going to be okay. He's got this. He's got the strings, all right? The worship team is going to come back up for a couple of songs while I pray, and then we'll have a, a benediction before we send you back out. It's just good being with you today. There's beauty in it. Father, uh, I hope your scripture has penetrated in, into our hearts, deep in our hearts. I think for someone like me who grew up reading the Bible a lot and in the church a lot, I often... Just let your words just wash through my head, like in one ear and out the other, but they're alive, and your word is alive, and it's, and it's new every morning. So I hope that those words that we've spoken today, your words, uh, will be life-changing for each of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody said the habitual position of faith is to wait on God. He called faith an abiding duty and a perpetual privilege. We have the privilege of putting our faith in Jesus Christ. That's a privilege. And sometimes when you're speaking up here, you'll say something and later you'll think, I hope nobody misunderstood. So when I was talking about a marionette, we have free will. God doesn't make us do things. I'm going to read this prayer. So this is a great book a friend gave me, A Diary of Private Prayer. John Bailey wrote it, and he is um, no longer walking this earth, but he was a seminary teacher many years ago. Almighty God, in this house of quiet, I seek communion with thee from the fret and fever of the day's business, from the world's discordant noises, from the praise and blame of men, from the confused thoughts and vain imaginations of my own heart, I would now turn aside and seek the quietness of thy presence. All day long, 
have I toiled and striven, but now, in stillness of heart and in the clear light of thine eternity, I would ponder the pattern my life has been weaving. May there fall upon me now, O God, a great sense of thy power and thy glory, so that I may see all earthly things in their true measure. Let me not be ignorant of this great thing, that one day is with thee as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Give me now such understanding of thy perfect holiness as will make an end of all pride in my own attainment. Grant unto me now such a vision of thine uncreated beauty as will make me dissatisfied with all lesser beauties. I am content, O Father, to leave my life in thy hands, believing that the very heads upon my head are numbered by thee. I am content to give over my will to thy control, believing that I can find it in thee, a righteous, a righteousness that I could never have won for myself. I am content to leave all my dear ones to thy care, believing that thy love for them is greater than my own. I am content to leave in thy hands the causes of truth and of justice and the coming of thy kingdom in the hearts of men, believing that my ardor for them is but a feeble shadow of thy purpose. To thee, O God, be glory forever and forever. Amen. Have a great day.